Hello and welcome to the Product Biz Podcast. My name is Monica Little. I'm your host and I am beyond excited for today's episode. Like super excited because this is going to be a little bit of a new series, mini series that I'm going to do for the next few episodes and then we'll see how it takes off from here. And I think it's going to be super, super valuable for you listening and also for the select small business owners that I'm going to highlight in these episodes. So I had this aha moment that came to me about a week, week and a half ago. If you've been listening to the podcast the past few episodes, I've kind of been ending with this ambiguous, like, maybe I'll be here next week. Maybe I'll be taking a couple of weeks off. Really, I'm just trying to find my groove with the podcast and figuring out what message do I want to share? Because I don't want to come here every single week if I don't have an actual message to share that I think will be beneficial for you. Like, I don't want to just fill up dead space with dead words that aren't impactful or aren't going to help you in some way. So that's why you've been hearing me say, like, if I'm inspired to say something, then I'm going to come on the podcast and do an episode. Very much the episode last week about packaging and labels was something that was super inspirational for me to come and talk about. And I just want to make sure that every single episode has that intention and inspiration behind it of like, oh, I know this is going to be helpful. I know this is going to be good. So I don't want to be another podcast that is just like a weekly episode and the weekly episode is kind of a boring episode or an episode of just someone talking in circles, which I know sometimes I tend to do, but I just want it to be worthwhile because if you're taking the time to listen, I want it to be good. So I had this aha moment about a week and a half ago of these mini episodes that I can do where I deep dive into a small business owner and give them a specific feedback on, hey, if I was running your business, if I was a business partner with you, this is what I would do. So very specific feedback to one small business. So that small business owner is obviously going to get a ton of feedback and also For you listening, if you're not the small business owner that's been highlighted, you're going to get so much actionable insights in terms of understanding how to look at your business, understanding these marketing strategies, seeing them, um, how they can be applied in real life with other examples, and then seeing how you can take that to your business. So I think it's just going to like pull the curtain back and you're going to see behind the scenes what to do, how to do it, how it all comes full circle. Because a lot of podcast episodes, mine included, it's very one dimensional in terms of it's about one topic. But how do we actually bring this full circle to be like, hey, this is how you would grow your business in general. Here are a few different ideas. And here's what I would prioritize. Here's what I would do first. And really giving that insight. And I think it's going to be awesome. So I had this aha moment, this little mini download that came to me. And I was like, cool, let's run with it. And then I was like, all right, well, what small businesses do I want to feature and talk about with these mini episodes. And then I had another aha moment that I should go into my Product Biz Academy members community, pitch them this idea and see what they say. So I went into the Product Biz Academy Facebook group and I was like, hey, I have this crazy idea to highlight one small business per week on the podcast and dive deep into their business, give them some insights on what I would do, what I would prioritize, unique marketing ideas, things to do to grow. Would you all like to be the guinea pigs of who I star on the show? And I was, I wasn't sure what people would say because it's a little bit of a spotlight to have your business on the podcast for me to talk about. And if you know me, like if, I mean, more so if you're in the coaching program, you know, I can be a fire hose sometimes just with a lot of information. And also I can be pretty, you know, direct and kind of like strict in in what I say and, and why I recommend it. So I was like, okay, we'll see if people are open to this or if they're like a little scared of what could happen from it. But so many people, it was a resounding yes. Like, this is great. Yes, please highlight my business. Some people did say, oh my God, I'm scared for you to talk about my business for 30 to 45 minutes on episode, but yes, sign me up. So it was awesome to see so many of my members say, yes, they would love to be part of this. So with that, today's episode, we are going to do a deep dive into one of my favorite small businesses, which is Sweet Rosie's Soaps. Now, you have to know a little bit of background as I dive into these businesses. So what I want you to do is to go to Sweet Rosie Soaps Instagram, which is Sweet Rosie's underscore soaps, S-W-E-E-T-R-O-S-I-E-S underscore soaps. Now, this is Rose, the owner of Sweet Rosie Soaps. And as soon as you get to her Instagram page, you are going to see how fun, how vibrant, how just amazing her products are. Now, what she makes and what she sells are dessert and donut soaps. 
So you you have to go to her Instagram. And if you haven't gone to her Instagram, you're missing out because she sells, for example, this soap, which is a chocolate donut that half of it has these like beautiful sprinkles on it, that it's also glazed with chocolate. And when you buy them and get them in person, they also smell just like a chocolate donut soap. Then she has a strawberry soap. She has a mint chocolate soap. She has um, like a fruit cereal soap, which literally smells like Fruit Loop cereal. She has so many unique, vibrant, super fun, very extremely realistic looking soaps that she makes and sells. And they are probably one of the most fun products that I have seen. And why I thought this would be a great episode to start is because her products are so unique. This is like the best place to be as a product business owner is to have something so unique that there are so many options of where you can take this business in order to grow. So when I was prepping for this episode in terms of what are the main things that I want to share with Rose and with you listening on how to grow a business that's a unique, fun, vibrant business with a handmade physical product, there's a couple things that came to me And really, it came down to the topic of having a marketing budget. So this is what I'm going to start with. And then you'll have specific insights that I'm going to share for Rose that you can also take for your business. But what I want to start with is that every single small business owner should have a marketing budget that they have specifically outlined for marketing initiatives. So what that means is how much money on a monthly or quarterly or annually, or you can do all of the above on an annual basis Are you setting aside specifically for marketing, specifically for getting your products in front of more people, specifically for building more hype around your products and your business? Now, what happens for most small business owners, and maybe you can relate to this, is They've never thought about a marketing budget and instead they just do some things. Maybe when they have some extra money or some more sales come in, then they think about, oh, what can I do with this? But I actually want you to think of it the other way. I want you to set aside a specific marketing budget that you have in your business that every single month you can pull from that budget and do something unique in your business to build hype and get in front of more people. So that's the number one thing I want you to think about right now. And this is going to depend on where your business is, how far your business is. But the key is that this marketing budget does not fluctuate dependent on your sales. So for example, if you have a slow month, it's not like, oh, well, I'm not going to use my marketing budget because I have a slow month. You can look at your overall annual sales and you can say, okay, how much of this can I attribute to a marketing budget? How much of this can I put aside that every single month I'm using up this budget in order to get in front of more people? Now, the beauty of this is when we talk about getting in front of more people, this marketing budget, when you use it should lead to more sales. So it's not like you're just throwing money outside in the wind. When you're intentional with your marketing in terms of external marketing, it should lead to more sales in one way or another. So if I were Rose from Sweet Rosie Soaps, that's the very first thing I would do. I would sit down and say, what is my marketing budget on an annual basis? And then let's break that down into a monthly basis. Where I would love a marketing budget to be, maybe if you are newer in business, is like 100 to 200 per month. That's it. And once you have that established, this is where I would recommend Rose to use this in her business and where you can potentially use it in your business. When you have this marketing budget, now it's where do we use this 100 to 200? Let's play with 200 just to have a little bit more room for ideas and idea generation. Where can I use this $200 on a monthly basis in order to grow my business? And the biggest room of opportunity for Rose, there's actually a couple that I see, which is fantastic. I love when there's actual room for opportunity because that means you're not like capping your limits. That means, oh my gosh, there's so much growth right at your fingertips. And when I see Rose's business, one of the biggest rooms for opportunity is her Instagram. So she has 465 followers. And when you go to her Instagram, the first thing that that I think of is like, oh my God, she should have 5,000 because her Instagram is fantastic. Her products are fantastic. She has great imagery. She has great reels. She has great colors. She did professional branding when she was inside Product Biz Academy. So she has great branding. She has the full package. And now it's just, how do we get in front of more people? When you have a great brand, when you have great Instagram, when you have great photography on your Instagram, then it's like, cool, we can use this marketing budget to get more people to your Instagram, which will then go to your website or Etsy to purchase. Now, 
this is a fun spot to be and an amazing place for room for growth because there's also some people who may be on the inverse where their Instagram still has a little bit of an identity crisis or it's very monotone. It's not connecting with the audience. It's it just has an identity crisis. I see that a lot with small business owners. And the beautiful thing with Rose, like I said, you should be following and pulling up her Instagram is when you land on it, you know exactly what her products are, what her vibe is, what her branding is about, what she sells, what she makes, and the, just the full picture of her business. So this is a beautiful opportunity for her to take that marketing budget. We're going to play with 200 a month and have a goal I would be super aggressive here and say Rose could very easily grow her Instagram by 500 followers a month. That's a little bit of an aggressive target and an aggressive goal. However, I think she has a unique, playful, fun, awesome brand and awesome product that it's not, it's not unachievable. Like it's, it's very much in reach. Now, how we would use this marketing budget in order to grow by 500 followers per month, and the goal is when you grow those followers that they go to your Etsy or your website and purchase, is to use that marketing budget to get in front of your target audience by leveraging other people on Instagram. This is one of my favorite ways to grow a profile. And with my own small business, Plant Based Beauty, I did this a ton. So what does that actually mean? That means finding people in your target audience who have their own followers, who are also your target audience, and sending them a free gift or two in exchange for them to talk about your product on their posts or on their stories. That's how simple it is. Now, when we look at Rose and her products and her Instagram, it's very clear that some of her target audience is people who love desserts, people who love donuts, people who love cakes, people who love desserts. And when I think about, okay, who are people on Instagram that love desserts, that all of their followers also love, probably love desserts, you can start to get a list of different types of influencers that you can potentially reach out to. So the first one that comes to mind is bakers. How many bakers are on Instagram when they are baking cakes and donuts and desserts where obviously everyone who follows them wants their recipes and loves to see the cakes and donuts and desserts that they're making, that if this baker went on their Instagram stories and said, oh my God, you guys, I just got this incredible donut and you wouldn't even believe it, it's actually a soap. All of those people who follow that person who love desserts would be like, oh my God, I want this dessert donut soap because I love donuts too. So bakers, super, super simple. Now I want you, if you're following along to do this strategy, to think of like four different types of categories of micro influencers or influencers that you could reach out to, to send free products to bakers, number one. And the first one is obviously going to be easy, right? Because it's going to be just what's, you know, obvious for plant-based beauty. It was people who had blogs about skincare, Okay, cool. I sell skincare. Obviously, people who talk about skincare, that's going to be great. So for Rose, the most obvious one is bakers. Now, what we're going to do is go three more layers deep for a total of four. And here is where this gets really interesting because I think I've talked about this on the podcast. It's called constraint, uh, creativity under constraint. And when you have creativity under constraint, you, you start to get these really unique ideas and really unique people in this case that you can partner with. So first is bakers. Next one, which I think is is a permutation of bakers, but actually different, is what about specifically kids and kids' desserts? And that could even kind of be like moms, right? So we have bakers, we have, which is just in general, maybe probably geared more towards adults. And then we can think about kids' desserts or moms who talk about you know, like fun meals for kids or just kids and moms related. There's something there. Now, as we take this one step further of, okay, who else loves loves desserts? You can think about party planners because party planners probably have some specific themes, especially when you think about maybe kids or younger or things like that, where maybe they have a donut theme party. So if someone is a party planner and they're always sharing the different themes and ideas and pieces that go into their party planning business or their party planning page or their party planning tips that they share, 
something like a dessert soap that fits perfectly as a party favor, for example, could fit with that. And when you really get this four layers deep, what's super interesting, and this is something that Rose mentioned to me once before, is this other fourth group. And this is what I mean by creativity under constraint. Who else loves donuts? And Rose mentioned to this to me once before. She said, when I sell my donuts at a gym that I'm part of, all of the bodybuilders and people go crazy for them, which is so interesting because what she said is a lot of bodybuilders or people who are like competing in bodybuilding competitions, they're pretty strict on their diet. And one thing that you're cutting off pretty early on if you're, if you're being strict for a competition is sugar. Because sugar doesn't fill you up, it makes your blood sugar crash, and they're probably eating minimal calories, so they're making sure those calories are like chicken and broccoli and rice, things that have macronutrients that will keep them full because they are on a limited calorie diet for this competition that they're training for. So she said that bodybuilders and people who are really into the gym love her donut soaps because they're not eating sugar or donuts at this time. However, they love donuts and it just reminds them of like, okay, keep working, keep going towards this competition. And then once the competition's over, I'm going to go get a donut. But they can have it in the meantime in the form of a soap. I think that is genius. So we have our marketing budget of 200 per month. And we have our goal of let's, let's go aggressive on Instagram and grow by 500 followers per month. And now we have these four permutations of potential people that we could partner with on Instagram. Bakers, kids desserts, or moms, party planners, and fitness micro influencers. Now, the interesting thing here is you can see that the direction that these four categories are going in are multiple different directions. And not all of them may be her actual target audience. Rose's target audience may be the people who love desserts just on a daily basis. However, when we go four layers deep and we have bakers, moms, party planners, and, and fitness I don't know, fitness people, we're going to call them. It may be that fitness people aren't her target audience. So, okay, cool. We're not going to change her page to be fitness oriented. And we're not going to change her page to be like, hey, are you a bodybuilder or are you an NPC competitor looking for a donut because you're on a strict diet and you can't eat donuts? Well, here's myself. We're not going to change her page to be about these four different types of people. We're going to keep her page about her target audience. However, we're going to get super, super scrappy and connect with these different types of people to grow her audience across multiple different avenues, multiple different types of people, and then see who follows and who buys. We're not changing any of her business branding pillars. We're not changing anything about her profile, but we're saying, hey, this is a good group of people who may be interested in this product. What if I partner with them and just see what happens? And this is where the fun part is. It's like trial and error. See what works and see what comes from it. So with these four groups, this is what I would do. We have a marketing budget of, let's say, 200 bucks a month. And to ship one donut or two donuts, we'll say if we ship two don donuts per person, that's going to be about $10. So essentially we could reach 20 different people per month, which is awesome. Now, what I would focus on is finding micro influencers in these categories. So for me personally, I didn't have luck with like reaching out to someone who has 100,000 or 200,000 followers and asking them to talk about your products if you are to send them something in the mail for free. Because usually people who are at that stage, they do want compensation. They've built a following. They've probably put multiple years into it. So for them to promote something, they probably want to get paid for it. And that's the, that's like the point of most of those influencers on why they're on Instagram, right? So what I would do is find micro influencers, people who have maybe between a thousand to 15,000 followers. Maybe the sweet spot is like seven or 8,000 followers and reach out to them and just explain about your business and offer to send them a couple of free products in exchange for them to share about it on their stories and to potentially post about it on their feed. I think that that second one isn't as necessary. I think people sharing on their stories is perfect enough for you to um, get some good exposure. 
Now you're going to have to reach out to quite a few people. Some people will say, yes, cool. Then you send it to them. Perfect. Then you may need a follow up to make sure they actually do it. It's a little bit of a process just to make sure it happens. However, here's the beauty of it. When there's 20 people per month that are sharing about your dessert soaps in this instance. And let's say each of them have potentially, let's go with 5,000 followers, 20 times 5,000. That's potentially 100,000 people you can get in front of. Now, we all know the Instagram algorithm, if someone has 5,000 followers, not all 5,000 people are going to see their stories. However, the point is like, this is a potential that's out there. So even if we take a fraction of that and say, okay, maybe 10% of all of their followings will actually see it, that's still 10,000 followers. And of of those 10,000 followers, if a certain percent click and go to Rose's Instagram and follow her, or maybe they instantly follow and buy because they're like, oh my gosh, I love this. I need this now. Now you're getting sales from it too. And you're going to easily cover that $200 and you're going to get followers who may purchase from you for the long run. And it's just going to grow. Now, the other benefit is not only are you getting exposed to more people, which will lead to more followers, which will lead to more sales. This is also an incredible way to have user generated content. So let's say that Rose reaches out to a baker who is like, yes, I would love to share about your donut soaps on my Instagram. And Rose sends her chocolate donut and her raspberry chocolate donut to this baker. And the baker shares about it on Instagram. Now, an incredible thing that can happen is Rose can reshare that on her stories and now her existing followers are going to see other people who have her donuts that love her donuts and it's going to create social proof that people are buying or using Rose's products and now her existing followers are going to be one step closer to also buying them themselves. How you can take this one step further is as they share about it on their stories, repurpose that content as a reel, repurpose that content as a post. Every single thing that you do, I know I've said this before on the podcast, every single thing that you do, you should be able to use it in three different ways. So here's the beauty of you send out a donut soap to a baker. Now they share about it. So you repurpose it on your stories, you repurpose it on your Instagram post. And if you want to take it one step further, you can repurpose this on your website having social proof of someone with your product. Like I said, I did this so much with plant-based beauty. If you go to my old plant-based beauty Instagram, shop plant-based beauty, and you scroll down a bit, you will see that I have so many images of other people using my avocado and algae face mask. And this is the exact strategy that I did. I reached out to so many different people and said, hey, can I send you my best-selling avocado and algae face mask? It's going to leave your skin super super soft, super smooth. You're going to absolutely love it. All I ask is for you you to share about it on your stories and also send me a picture of you with the mask on. And that's what those people did. So if you go on my Instagram, you can see that I have so many individuals using my face mask and that creates social proof, that creates FOMO, that creates excitement. And then on my plant-based beauty website, which is no longer active, but on the avocado and algae face mask page, I had small little squares of about 18, 16 to 18 different people with the face mask on. So if you can imagine the description of the product, the photo of the product, the ingredients, directions, the benefits, right underneath that, I had a bunch of small squares of people wearing my face mask, those photos. And then under that, I had reviews. How much social proof is that for someone who's on the website about to buy? Now, if you don't have a website, you can do that on Instagram. You can create a collage of all these people with the product. Boom, social proof right there. So now you can see this marketing budget is also is going to grow followers, lead to more sales, lead to Instagram content, lead to website or Etsy content. And that $200 is actually being stretched in a really, really big way. So if I were Rose, it would be like guns blazing on this. Prioritize this on Monday. Do this for a few hours every single Monday. Find people in these four categories. Don't exclude anyone. Because the point of anything in business is trial and error. Just see what works. Find people in every single one of those categories. Reach out to them. Follow up to them. Send the products to them. Follow up to them again. And then use that content and see what happens. I think getting 500 followers per month should be super, super simple in that way. Now, I want to mention a couple other things. because I know I've been talking about this particular one for like 20 minutes. Because I think there's a couple other opportunities, amazing opportunities for growth that Rose also has. 
And part of this feedback is going to be because I definitely know Rose and her business. She's been in Product Biz Academy for over a year now. So um, I see what she's up to. I've obviously followed her on Instagram. She's in our Facebook community, community. So I know what she's up to. And I'm going to change directions slightly. We're still going to talk about marketing budget here. And here's another idea and another one to consider, another one to also do another one that I think is going to be really impactful. So we talked about Rose and how she makes donut and dessert soaps. She also makes a couple other types of soaps. For example, daisy soaps. So these beautiful yellow daisies, these teal blue boxes that kind of look like jewelry boxes with that teal blue, very prominent color that we all know. And she has a couple other items like apple soaps and pumpkin soaps, depending on the time of the year, little cake slices and things like that. One thing that I've really noticed with Rose lately is that when she has orders on fair that she shares on her Instagram stories, a lot of store owners are buying the items other than the donut soaps, which is very interesting because Rose has like 12 different variations of donut soaps. Her donut soaps are most of her business and primarily what she talks about and shares about however on fair where she's reaching these retailers they're buying more of the teal boxes they're buying more of the daisies they're buying more of the lemon soaps so there's interesting just insights that can come from that which comes back to the marketing budget if i were rose if there is a retailer who buys items on fair or otherwise from store outreach and doesn't get a donut in their order. I would add one donut to their order. Because what this is telling me when they're not adding donuts, which is like Rose's bread and butter are these donuts are so unique. It's telling me one of two things. It's telling me that the photos on fair should be elevated because something with these photos isn't capturing people's attention. Something about these photos may not be drawing them to it. And that's why in the meantime, which we can talk about photos as well, in the meantime, if the photos aren't capturing their attention, let's send them one with their package, which is already going out. Give them one donut soap because Rose's packaging is beautiful. She has an incredible brand sticker on the back of her donut that she had professionally designed. And overall, her donuts are just spectacular, spectacular. So these retail owners just need to see them. And then you can write a beautiful note that goes out to the retailer saying, thank you so much. I added one of our best selling chocolate sprinkled donut soaps for you to see too. If you'd like to order any, come back to our fair shop and place an order today. This is something I also did with plant-based beauty. If someone would buy, for example, a ton of the Heal and Glow Facial Serum and a ton of the Cacao Dry Shampoo, but they didn't buy the Avocado and Algae Face Mask, which is one of my best sellers, I'd give them a freebie. Let the, the store owner or the buyer try it out, fall in love with it, and then when they come back, hopefully they will buy it. So that's something I would do for Rose moving forward is if there's a store owner who isn't buying the donut soaps add your best-selling donut soap into the package it's a nice way to build a relationship too because they're like oh how cool i got a freebie i get to try this and also it will hopefully lead to them purchasing it now that would be for our all store owners moving forward and here's an interesting concept again going back to that marketing budget of can we go back to previous store owners and send them a little package and say thank you so much for your past order of our teal boxes and daisy soaps. I wanted to send our best-selling donut soaps for you to also try out. We hope things are going well. If you need anything, contact us, blah, 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 blah. So now it's like going a little bit above and beyond and sending them a little package to check in, how are things, build the relationship, and also incentivize them to per purchase a donut. Now, of the three that I've talked about so far, Instagram, sending out free items, fair and store outreach, giving one free donut for future order orders, and this fair and store outreach, sending a donut to past orders. This is the one that I would prioritize like number three. Don't do this off the bat because um, the other ones I think are going to be more impactful. However, this is a potential if there is a month where you have a marketing budget and you're like, hmm, I got 200 in this marketing budget and I haven't used it just yet. Cool. Here's an idea of what you can do to go back to some of your past retailers and reignite the relationship and also show them what else you have. Perfect right there. With this in mind, I alluded to if store owners aren't buying the donuts on fair, I wonder if there's something with the photography that could be updated. And this is something that I think so many people can learn from. 
which is as your business grows, it happens in stages. And what happens to so many small business owners is, and this happens a lot in Product Biz Academy, which is super, super interesting. What happens before someone joins Product Biz Academy is they're kind of stuck. They're trying all these things and maybe they're not getting the traction that they want. So they're like, there's got to be something more. They join Product Biz Academy. They learn these new tips and tricks and all of a sudden their business grows. And the interesting thing is your business will grow and then all of a sudden it's going to plateau again. Now, what's happening here is business growth happens in stages. And when you hit that second plateau, now you have to go above and beyond what you just did to continue to evolve to get to that next stage. This is where I think a lot of people get stuck because, and and this happens, I'm sure, in cases outside of Product Biz Academy too, but you do something, your business grows and you're so excited and it's awesome and it's growing. And then all of a sudden it plateaus and you keep doing the same thing you've always done. And you're like, what the hell? It's not growing. And it's like, yes, because you've hit the max of that ceiling. And in order to get to the next level, you got to do something different. And then you're going to hit the max of that ceiling. And then in order to hit the next level, you're going to have to do something different. So there's, there's stages, there's ceilings, and it's this constant evolution. One of the biggest opportunities of growth that I think Rose has is going to be photos on her Etsy page and her fair page. When you look at Rose's Instagram, her photos are absolutely fantastic and they're super colorful and vibrant and fun. And I think we want to make sure that we're bringing these incredible types of photos to those other platforms as well. We got a little bit of insight, I think, on FAIR that maybe there's some adjusting in the donut soap photos that will help to bring more sales to it. And also from personally working with Rose, I know that she's kind of hit that plateau on Etsy. So when she first joined Product Biz Academy, massive growth on Etsy. And then it was like, oop, hit that ceiling. And now it's like, okay, well, what are you going to do to get out of that and get to the next level? And hundred percent, it's going to be photos. 1000%. This is also something really interesting that happens when people increase their prices. When you increase your prices, your marketing has to increase with it as well. Your perceived value of your products has to increase as well. And how we do that is by incredible product photography. So for Rose, I think there's so much amazing opportunity in terms of photography on Etsy in particular. I would get white backdrop photos professionally done of the single donut with a white backdrop, crystal clear photo highlighting the amazing product and just elevating those, those photos to have them refreshed with the more elevated way, which matches her higher pricing that she recently did. And also will help kind of get out of that plateau on Etsy. Now, the fun part, which we actually talked about in a group coaching call a couple weeks ago, is Rose also has these fun photos with colored backdrops too. So now it's like, okay, cool. We've got these elevated white backdrop photos. And also let's add a listing with a really fun background. So for example, if you're looking on our Instagram, there's this piece of cake that kind of has this rainbow um, slanted line background and then a yellow bottom, which the piece of cake is on. There's also this cupcake, which has pink polka dot background and a pink ground color that, that the cupcake is on. So here is where you can start to add some variation to your Etsy listings and just see what performs better. Have the incredible white backdrop photos and also have these really fun photos with pink polka dot background and a rainbow slanted line background and different colors, different textures where the product really pops. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to see what works on Etsy and you can have these same photos also on FAIR. You can see what works on FAIR. The key here for anyone who's listening, though, is that you have to continue to evolve your marketing. And this is a beautiful part where marketing budget comes into play, too, because maybe one month your marketing budget goes towards new product photos, new white backdrop photos or new colored backdrop photos. Then you can plop those on Etsy, on Fair. You can use them on Instagram, on your website. Beautiful. Now you're continuing to elevate and evolve. I want to just pause and really hone in on this. I think you guys hear me talk about photos and the importance of them a lot. Maybe not here. I know my Product Based Academy members do. But when we think about professional photography and photos and the importance of it, it's because people can't smell, touch, see, feel your product through imagery. 
they can only see it in the one dimension that the photo is in front of them. So we have to make sure that our photography is as elevated as possible. I will say that 99% of people who are struggling to make sales on Etsy or on FAIR or even on their website, it's because the photos, it's because the branding, it's because the words that you use. Now, I think for Rose, her branding is spot on and the words that she used to describe her products in terms of her Etsy listings and the graphics that she creates, she's been working on that for a while inside Product Based Academy and I think that it's also spot on. So if, if there's one of those three buckets where she has room to grow, if it's 100% the photos and I think that is such an awesome place to be because that's just going to grow her business and elevate it even further. Now, for the person listening, if you're like, okay, cool, that's also where I fall into that bucket of I need to elevate my photos and then, then Fantastic. Amazing. You just uncover something that can grow your business even further. So really these three ways for Rose to grow her business are going to be things that you can take away too. We talked about having a defined marketing budget that you have every single month for ways to get in front of new customers, ways to elevate your business. We talked about using that marketing budget to grow your Instagram by finding super unique micro influencers that have people in their audience that would like your products and reaching out to them. We talked about cross-selling with the stores that you're in and giving them one of your best sellers to see if you can incentivize them to add that to their next order. And we also talked about how your business growth happens in stages and how elevating your branding, your photography, and the words that you use are going to help you grow more on Etsy, on FAIR, on Instagram, and anywhere that you are plateauing. So if you think that you've like plateaued anywhere, check those avenues and say, where do I have room for growth in order to overcome that plateau? The last thing I want to end here is we didn't talk about website really at all. I had some side little conversations about website. The interesting thing here is Rose uses Etsy as her main website. And for where she is in her business and how much how much opportunity there still is. And I mean that in like the best way possible. Like I don't think she needs a website. And that's not something I will say very often. The reason I say that with Rose is because her products are so unique that they do the selling because they are so unique. That if trying to find the right ways to to put this into into words a lot of times website is needed for the purpose here let me let me say this a lot of times you need a website in order to connect with retailers to connect with store owners to connect with people on instagram because you may be in a really saturated market space where people need to go to those places in order to really understand what your product is what your brand is what you stand for how your product is different how your product is unique and understand the full experience Now with Rose, her products are so unique right off the bat when you look at them that I don't think that's necessary. And the super interesting thing is she got accepted to FAIR without having her own website. So that verifies that it's not really necessary at this point in her business, that she doesn't need it. She's kind of like carving her own path where I would put website a little bit on the back burner. I don't think it's necessary. And if it is something that's being worked on simultaneously, I would just make sure you're carving out time for these avenues that we talked about. And it's not like all of my time is going to website and I'm getting bogged down into website creation and I'm going to be absent on Instagram and I'm not going to elevate my business in any other ways because I'm so busy on my website. Like that's what I would not recommend. So if website is a project that Rose is working on, then it's cool. I have 15 hours per week to work on my business. I'm going to allocate five to website and 10 and five to product, uh, making inventory, shipping products, and five to these marketing initiatives right here, because these marketing initiatives are going to be the ones that actually lead to sales. Sitting behind the computer, creating a website and spending all day long bogged down behind the scenes, creating a website doesn't lead to sales. Launching a website doesn't lead to sales. It's how you drive people to that website that leads to sales. And everything we've talked about, about growing Instagram, getting new photos will eventually get people to your website. So I just don't want someone who's in a similar boat as Rose of like super unique product. Etsy is working great place already in fair Rose is in over 40 stores. Like what she has works. I think it's just about elevating it and getting in front of more people through the ways that we talked about today. 
So I think that's how I want to end this episode because I've been going for almost 40 minutes. Wow, the that there's a lot of different ways to run a business. And leaning into what's working and also seeing how you can continue to evolve what's working and also seeing where you have like low hanging fruit. Where's some easy stuff where that will just be like super quick and super easy to continue to grow. And I'm one of the biggest fans of Sweet Rosie soaps. Her soaps are absolutely incredible. Amazing gifts, amazing party favors, amazing if you're a dessert donut lover. And she has just done an absolutely incredible job. So that's why I wanted to highlight her first in this mini series because I wanted to give a little special attention, shout out to her incredible business and also just give some super, super supportive advice that I think will really help. So with that, I'm going to end this episode. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'd love to hear from you if this was helpful. So for the person who is not the owner of Sweet Rosie Soaps, like, let me know. Was this helpful to hear how I would approach this business, what I would focus on, um, where time and energy would go. Would love to hear that because this is how businesses are built. This is how empires are built. And I'm just excited to be able to share this with you. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you need me, find me on Instagram, Monica Little Coaching, and I will see you next week on the Product Biz Podcast.